Chapter 12. Treasure Moon. Summary. Add Holiday Plants 2.0. Here we come. Notes. TW. Creepy human experiments, not super descriptive. This is the last one with both of our heroes together before a while, and we're at the end of that pack 33 BBY summer, and I need to stop with the shared bed trope, it is getting ridiculous at this point, I take full blame for indulging. Hope you like it, and many thanks for your comments and crudis, they're very much appreciated. Chapter Text. Chapter 12. Treasure Moon. When she woke up after what felt like a very restful night of sleep, Anya was curled up against Khan, her face pressed against his steadily rising chest. She could hear his heart, the constant calming beat music to her soul. His body was pleasantly warm against hers, the heat extremely efficient against the chilly air of the ship. In the background, the force was thrumming peacefully, the bond feeling like soft silk. It felt amazing, and she just wanted to go back to sleep against him, but her brain wouldn't let her. She must have moved during her sleep, which in itself wasn't completely unexpected, and the thought of Khan finding her sprawled on his body like he was some sort of giant stuffed animal mortified her. She panicked for a few seconds when his breathing grew a touch quicker, then realized Khan was still as a dead tree and very much asleep. She moved away slowly, trying to put a bit more distance between them, and dislodged his arm wrapped around her shoulders before getting out of the bunk, instantly shivering as the cold seized her again. This was getting dangerous. As soon as they were close, she got those stupid thoughts that polluted her mind, and when they touched, she was behaving like a brain-dead idiot. Despite her initial reservations, she hadn't disliked the sleeping thing at all, and was actually looking forward to doing it again when they got back from sojourn. It felt like something out of her romantic hollows, having to share body heat with a mortal enemy in a dire situation, always in a surprisingly small bed, and when there were plenty of other options available. Except Khan wasn't her enemy, they hadn't willingly done more than touching shoulders fully clothed, they had very few other options that didn't involve getting out of hyperspace, and the bunk was adequately large to fit two persons, perhaps even three. Still, when she would be alone in her giant bed on Coruscant, she knew she was going to think about it, over and over. She was going to dream of it during her long days of boring meetings, pretending to be really attentive when in truth she didn't give a flying criff about most of what was said. Anya rolled her eyes. She was being a fool, again. Khan had been nothing but kind and respectful, backing off first earlier when they got caught on the bond's feedback loop, asking for her consent before moving closer to her in the bed, and even Dot. Even on Corbin, when she was still raw from her trip down memory lane and panicked at the idea of anyone touching her, he had reacted with tacks she hadn't known he was capable of. And here she was, always a second away from ruining their relationship with her stupid feelings. Anya looked at his sleeping face and held back a fond smile. It felt like the tight, icy walls she tried to keep around herself to avoid being hurt again were melting a little bit more with each second they spent together. Her heart was beating faster now, pounding against her chest, and her mouth was drier than a desert, her body shaken by the sentiment pulsating in her mind. He didn't seem to realize it, but he had changed a lot since they went back in time. He was more open, happier too. He was usually very nice to be around despite the occasional instability. He could laugh, now, he made her laugh too, and more than anything she knew he was starting to trust her, and she wanted to show him he was right to do so, that his trust wasn't misplaced. And here she was fantasizing about his high cheekbones and cleft chin, and how great it would feel to wake up every morning to that sight, held by strong, warm arms. She was such an idiot. Criff, if it was just that, she could have managed, she had crushes before. In her true youth, every holodrama actor with a somewhat charming smile made her swoon, but even if Khan was particularly attractive, it would have just stayed a stupid passing infatuation, if that was his only redeeming quality, she was not the type to fall solely for someone's beauty, not anymore. No, it ran deeper, probably even deeper than. Corner. She grimaced, old familiar pain coursing through her veins. That train of thoughts. It was not untrue though, Khan elicited similar emotions, weak, silly, dangerous emotions she was reluctant to let go of, even if it was her duty, even if the last time she failed to do so everything went worse. At the time she had been utterly convinced that Jax was the one and only, the love of her life, her hero in shiny armor. Well, at least the armor part had been true. Force. What was wrong with her? She retreated to the refresher, splashing her face with cold water to dismiss her terrible morning reflections, and hastily dressed up in a combat outfit. Sojourn was pretty much unknown territory for her, but despite her complete trust in Khan's intentions, the ominous feeling that plagued her since before Corbin hadn't left. It might be there for fun and destructive purposes, but something told her it would still be wise to be prepared for trouble. Anya should really have paid attention before she got out, but she didn't, still lost in thoughts, and walked in on an enticing Khan struggling to put on his shirt. She averted her eyes and pretended to be very preoccupied with her suitcase, but her flushed cheeks and the heat that was devouring her belly begged to differ. She was pining for him so hard it actually hurt. This entire thing was wrong on so many levels. I'm sorry she said, genuinely contrite, I hadn't realized you were awake. 
Khan tilted his head slightly like he always did when he didn't fully understand something. Adorable. She needed to get a grip. I'll make some calf, do you want some? Calf sounds like heaven right now. It tasted pretty good too, warming her soul against the freezing cold of the ship, and it also gave her the necessary energy to focus on something that was not Khan's well-defined abs, and how at home their easy dynamic made her feel. For example, her up-and-coming relief mission on Ryolf, providing food, constructing shelters for refugees, and bringing medical supplies and trained doctors and nurses to help the locals after a series of terrible terrorist acts, targeting the political power in place. She had finalized the last details during the meeting of the Senate Committee for Intergalactic Relief, after discussing their dire situation with Cal and Nat this summer, and they would start to send help right away. Three shipments would be made, each of them protected by GD, to ensure the help would reach the locals. She would be on the second shipment, leaving three weeks later. It felt a bit sour because she was 80% sure that her uncle was actually behind the success of Ku's destabilizing Ryolf, but confronting him about it was not in her plans, so she had to suck it up and try to help on her level. The politician part of her, however, was grateful for the opportunity. This one was sure to make her shine. Nothing was more compelling than a pretty girl feeding the poor in necessitous, trying to mend the wounds of a nation with the strength of her gorgeous smile and tiny, pale arms. If her next bill didn't pass it would be a miracle. She had drafted it with her team and was thinking of submitting it in one or two months, depending on how Valorum handled Iriadu. It was nothing special really on the surface, more budget readjustments on different sectors to free money in a period where the Republic was struggling a bit. The main idea was to cut off part of the military funding, and to reorganize the most useless Senate subchambers and cabinets, to ease the current pressure on galactic taxpayers. Her main arguments were the current lasting peace and the need for efficiency, not bureaucracy in the Senate. It would not get her friends everywhere, but the general discontentment with the current proceedings and the distaste many felt for the unused troops being trained for nothing, released after a few years and filling up the ranks of bounty hunters and pirates, would be enough to sway most of her fellow senators into agreeing. Plus, it was both a great opportunity for Valorum to use his newfound popularity to gain more support, and a step away from Palpatine's clever moves to weaken the Republic. Anya grabbed her datapad and wrote down efficiency not bureaucracy, since it could be an inspiration for a future slogan, then opened a couple of whole meals while drinking her calf. She nearly spat it out a couple of seconds later, attracting an inquisitive look from Khan. What is it? Uncle Yan is giving me a ship. He shrugged. And? I mean yours is nice, but you are used to changing regularly, aren't you? Anya shook her head, eyes shining in excitement. Think bigger, and I'm keeping my yacht for now, it's only two years old, and I had the captain's cabin refurbished earlier this year, it would be a shame to give it up. Is he getting you a warship? He asked, his tone vaguely incredulous. An Arquitans class. He told me to find a name starting with A to baptize it. It should be ready in five months for my birthday. She was stupidly excited about it too, now that she had around a minute to digest the news. That was, for once, both completely unexpected and completely welcomed. Khan frowned. Did he say why? Probably to arm Sereno while pretending he is spoiling me, but his whole mail just states that since I have developed such an interest in ships, it made sense to get me my own light cruiser, especially since I'm traveling so much to outer rim planets. He wants you to get rid of the GD escort. With a battlecruiser and his crew, they become completely obsolete. I guess so. It will make our life a lot easier she replied, already adjusting her calculations to integrate this new interesting element to them. Do you have any idea? For the name. Anya thought about it a couple of seconds, then smirked at him. She had a name, a powerful one, thought specifically to honor Khan and his dubious Sith activities. The name of a famed three-headed wolf god living in the volcanoes of Munalinst. When Amun disobeyed it was said that the wolf woke up and got one of his head out. Depending on the head that showed up Amun would get eaten alive, would lose his intelligence, or would get a chance to right his wrongs. It was a common saying that Amun would prefer to be eaten alive, as the other options would bring a dishonor worse than death. In theory, it should not be super offensive to the banking clans, since it was also the name of a giant sea serpent on Arcanus, a legendary fleet that went to the unknown region and came back, and a man-eating plant on a banshee. Khan, however, would always know what she was referencing. Annabel. He rolled his eyes and she chuckled behind her cup of calf, finding her own joke hilarious. I don't even know how you heard of this one. My father, actually. He held no love for the mutants. You don't speak about him often. Banya hesitated a couple of seconds and saw his gaze soften. They had told each other everything of importance about their lives, when they first decided to come back to the past, and her father had not been mentioned since. I don't. He was a great man, complicated perhaps, but always there for us. Was he from Sereno, like your mother? He asked, his tone surprisingly gentle. She smiled and shook her head lightly. No, he was born and raised on Arcania. They met when he came to Sereno for negotiations with my grandfather Gore. And he chose to stay for the girl. Romantic. Anya laughed a bit. 
He didn't, but he did come back an unusual amount of times from what I heard, and he ended up proposing a couple of years afterward. And he literally bought Sereno for Gore to reluctantly approve of their union, erasing the decades of debts he and Rammel had amassed with their stupid spending and inconsistent ruling. But that was one of the planet's secrets, and even she wasn't supposed to know about it. She had been a bit closer to her mother, sharing her culture and her love for stories, but when she was a little girl her father had been the hero to many of her tales. He was tall, broad-shouldered, with long white hair and piercing light grey eyes, his chin always held high, his stride confident. He felt like an ice castle in the force, all sharp edges and frostiness, but the fortress always melted for her mother and her. He had been an arrogant man, an indomitable king, a clever politician, and a loving father. Sometimes, she still hated Yan Duku for having him and her mother killed. In front of her, Khan looked deep in thoughts. She figured after having no paternal figures for most of his life, and then being a paternal figure himself for a relatively short time before his son's death, the regular experience of fatherhood was something highly unusual for him. She saw his curiosity take over again and smiled softly, mellowed by his eagerness. Do you still have family from his side? I understood that from your mother's there was only Duku left. I also have an aunt and cousin on my mother's side, both in exile following the coup, and another uncle from my father's side, but we never met. And they could all rot in hell as far as she was concerned. Blood traitors on one side, reputed asshole on the other. If she ever got crowned ruler of Sereno, she knew exactly who she would not invite. Why? He asked, tilting his head again. Family meant a lot to him, he never had blood relationships that lasted long enough for them to sour. Anya, on the other hand, had been bathed in familial conflicts since before her birth, half of her mother's family hating the other, and she had no interest in renewing the experience with her last blood relatives, it was hard enough to get along with her uncle alone. My paternal grandfather was an Arcanian from a prestigious line, the Adaska, with a pretty Arcanian wife and a son. He had my father with his son's human nanny, and she vanished mysteriously soon after. Abel, my uncle, and Azrael, my father, grew up together, but that's about it. They got half of their father's companies each and went their separate ways as soon as they could. I don't think they ever saw each other again after he moved to Sereno. So you're telling me your Arcanian father's name was Azrael Adaska, but you still want to go with an obscure reference to a mu needing god for the ship. He deflected, probably sensing how nostalgic thinking about the past made her feel. Well it reminds me of him, and I like the reference to you too she said, smiling. Plus Uncle Yan would lose it if I name his expensive gift with any direct reference to my father, they weren't particularly close. That was a bit of a euphemism for he had him obliterated in a ship crash, and would react badly if I remind him of it, but from the expression on Khan's face, he got the gist of it. They dropped the subject again, and she felt kind of sorry for ruining the pleasant mood with her dreary family history. They migrated back to the cockpit shortly after for the last short jump on the Intrala route, and after a quick hour of navigating in seemingly empty space, a brilliant jewel stood before them. Sojourn, small, gleaming with greens and blues, orbiting around a consequent planet whose surface seemed covered in menacing yellow gases. Probably improper for any type of life form to develop, which explained why the moon stayed off the radar. It was not hard to find Percy if you knew where to look, but it would be completely improbable to just happen to discover the moon where it was floating, away from any type of civilization. Khan maneuvered swiftly, breaking atmosphere a tad too fast in his usual fashion, before landing with style on the spaceport, while she admired the lush woods, beautiful gardens, and pretty expenses of water she could see from the transperisteel viewport. There was three main buildings, a huge stone fort in an ancient style with turrets and inside courtyards, and two barns framing the only paved way from the spaceport to the fort. Her first impression upon setting foot on Sojourn was that the moon was gorgeous in the most outrageous way possible. She frowned under the hood she had done in case any security system here included cameras, and shifted a tad closer to Khan, masked and reaching deep in the force, assessing the place. It reeked in an oily way she had felt in the company of some of her fellow senators, speaking of all debaucheries and still standing alliances. She could picture it as they strolled down the main road that she saw earlier, huge hunts of exotic endangered animals, roasts in the evenings, dancers and soft music, the flames licking at the perfumed meat, while casting a warm glow in the secret of the night. An exquisite gathering of the influential actors of the galaxy, basking in vanity, indulging in their worst vices, forming plots with their kind, away from the public eye, while the Sith Lord watched in quiet satisfaction. The place coaxed his visitors into instant relaxation, lowering their guards and boundaries, leaving them open to suggestion. It was dangerous in a completely different way than Corbin, and while she could appreciate the rare blossoming flowers and the chance of supposedly extinct birds, a big part of her wanted to scar the moon, ravaging its appearing beauty to reveal its ugly innards. It was not dissimilar to Coruscant in a certain way, and she saw now more than ever, how the Sith thrived on the city planet where deceit and lies reigned. Khan stiffened, and she got thrown out of her thoughts by a disagreeable sight. A pair of silver-armored sun guards were guarding the main entrance of the fort, and they saw them just as clearly as Ani did. Was this planned? 
She asked, slightly anguished. If it wasn't, she was declaring this trip officially jinx. I knew they could be there, but the risk was too low to truly consider he replied, the vocoder making it hard to decipher his tone. Oh, force, perfect. Are there others? Khan nodded, looking perfectly at ease with the idea. Another pair on the opposite entrance leading to the woods. A quiet fight then. He sighed, producing a huff of static with the mask. I'll take care of them. And he did. Anya shivered violently when she heard the sickening crack resonate in the warm yet crisp air of sojourn. The two guards crumbled instantly, their necks bent in an unnatural angle, dead. Khan hadn't even extended his hand, but the force around him had leaped, eager and dangerous, brushing against her like a fire so cold it burned. Even knowing he wasn't going to hurt her, the feeling it left her was enough to dismiss any sort of relaxation the planet had induced. They moved as quietly as possible around the fort, trying to get a feel for the other guards in the force, to ensure they did not move, and then he did it again as soon as they were in sight. It had taken them around 15 minutes in total. Usually, she would have honored them in some way, easing their transition in the force and mourning the lives lost, but they were not a kills, and a very vindictive part of her remembered vividly Carner telling her with a gaze full of pride that his father had been a sun guard before he became a royal guard. Deviously, she hoped that the man was among the four Khan had killed, and wondered how terrified the asshole would be, if he had seen the ease with which Khan off them. She released the negative feelings and malicious glee carefully in the force, surprised by their intensity. Clearly, the place had a bigger impact on her than what she initially thought, she would have to stay on her toes. Now as alone on the moon as they could be, they decided to split up to explore the fort. It was lavishly decorated and, for the trained eye, obviously referenced the Sith history and secrets. She could feel some of the spells artfully woven into the stones, misdirecting undesired guests and hiding the interesting rooms. It was very clever, really, and she could easily see how Plagueis was able to keep up his charade the whole time, for the average person it was just a somewhat tastefully renovated old fort, with a few more gruesome paintings than usual. It had two upper floors, a ground floor with the inner courtyards and the greenhouses, and a hidden underground laboratory that Khan had wanted to visit first. She had toured the ground floor quickly, finding sleek and tastefully decorated guest suites, the kitchens, a gigantic dining hall, a ballroom with shiny flooring, and a few sitting rooms still equipped with death sticks, sansana spice, and aged alcohol. The expensive furniture looked well maintained, and she crossed a few mouse droids cleaning the wooden floors, but apart from a general appreciation for the design and a pottery collection that had definitely been stolen from a museum and was for sure worth an insane price, she found nothing of interest. She took the stone stairs up, there was a turbo lift, but to go one floor up, it seemed a bit overkill, and reached out through the force, feeling the knots of power created by the spells colliding softly with her own signature, coaxing her into avoiding a place in particular. She smiled and strode on, following the increasing agitation around her, even as each of her steps got more and more difficult to take. At the apex of it, she found a cozy library behind a door that blended so well with the wall, that she would have never found it if she hadn't looked. Bingo. The room was a clever mix of old and new flimsy books, ancient armchairs, and artworks intermixed with stacks of data pads, data tapes, and holo books. An holodable was situated in the middle of the room, its shiny metal contrasting sharply with the creaking wooden floor and the ancient Sith tapestries covering the stone walls. She walked to it and activated it, curious to see what was the last thing it showed. It was as it turned on, the 3D flickering for a few seconds before settling on a star map. She recognized it instantly. Tatooine, its twin suns and three moons. How unsurprising. The map was annotated and kitted in two places. One right on top of Mos Espus at Sathari, the other, in the eastern dune sea, Setrakata. Interesting, but not really what they were here for. She tried a few other data tapes, including a basic concept of the Death Star, incriminating recordings of various powerful individuals, and a couple of annotated star maps with planets of interest for the Sith Lord. It seemed Plagueis had his fingers in many pots, and relied on an impressive network to procure him useful information and blackmail material. Intrigued, she dismissed the ancient books, mostly Sith history-related tomes, and grabbed a couple of data pads, before settling on one of the leather armchairs. They were too big for her, as expected, since mutants were taller than humans by quite the margin, but comfortable enough to forgive the fact her feet didn't touch the ground. The data was well organized, meshing pictures, videos, sound recordings, and holo mails into different categories, but she was lacking context for most if not all of them when they were not encrypted heavily, and she quickly gave up once she realized the sheer amount of information kept there. She would have to take it back home and have a closer look with the help of droids to decode everything and see what could be useful. With both her and Khan's knowledge, they had a pretty good picture of current and future events on the surface, but Plagueis was leading the dance in the shadows, away from the public eye. This was a true treasure. Opening her backpack, she withdrew a data card and launched the download of all data pads on it, while she looked around for more. She was kind of hoping for a moving wall with a secret room behind it, but her search yielded no such results. 
She did however burn her fingers through her gloves on a particularly aggressive Sith book that she couldn't open. Thinking it might be interesting for Khan she packed it in her bag with the data tapes and the data card. The holobook's collection looked as boring as the rest for the few she managed to open, and she resolved to bring Khan in the library, so he could choose what he wanted to bring home, and what would stay here to be destroyed. Satisfied with her visit, she exited the room and toured the rest of the floor quite quickly. Plague's personal quarters were right next to the library, well protected and luxurious in a more spartan way than the public areas of the place, with all furniture and decor being somehow darker black. Cliché. She found a considerable wardrobe, shelves of books in the office, all related to finance, mathematics, and science this time, and a safe behind a painting that had no visible unlocking mechanism. She would have to show this one to Khan too. Across from, there were other quarters, decorated in a lighter cream color scheme with teal accents, and basked in the warm afternoon light. Large windows revealed a beautiful view of the forest, and there were some model spaceships on the bedside tables and the dresser. The kids' room. She went back to the door, intrigued, and found locks on the outside of the quarters. Now frankly curious, she continued her visit of the rooms with a luxurious bathroom and a large adjacent wardrobe, already filled with clothes definitely made for a child. Going through the bathroom again to go out, she noticed something unusual about the rolled white towels and picked one up. It was embroidered, with Anakin's first name. What the hell was that about? Spooked by the combination of the embroidered towels and the locks on the door, she exited the place with an uneasy shiver. She found nothing else on the first floor outside of a large and mostly empty training room, that either indicated Plague's used seldom accessories during his training, or that the place had already been ransacked. Noting the fact with a slight frown, she left the room and climbed the stairs again to the second floor. She was quickly disappointed. It looked like servants' quarters, with tiny rooms and windows, and nothing sparkled in the force of all. The turrets were not particularly interesting either, just offering great viewpoints of the surrounding landscape. Boring, boring, boring. Mal pinched in a pout, she relented and took the turbo lift to the underground floor. Khan's presence was about half a click away from her, probably in one of the laboratories. She exited the lift and had to force herself not to get back inside the lift immediately. Now this place felt a lot more like a dark cider den. The narrow stone corridors were lit by dim flickering green lights, and the floor felt wet and a bit sticky on her boots. Whatever was leaking, it wasn't water, and it didn't smell good. She moved as fast as she could without running, unhinged by the sheer malevolence that seemed imprinted in the very walls, and crossed a few open doors, revealing some sort of cells, ritual chambers, and what must have been experimentation rooms. Outside of the floors, everything was relatively clean, if obviously abandoned for quite a few years, but the sight of restraints, metal cots, examination tables, and old scratches on the walls, did nothing to warm her heart to the place. When she finally found Khan in one of them, her heart was beating fast, and a nervous feeling had settled around her gut, twisting her organs in messy knots. She wanted to leave. She wanted to leave right now, to run back to the ship and flee the planet. He looked up as he saw her, the mask uninviting and cold, but she could feel the warmth of his gaze behind it, and something inside her eased at the sight. He was bent over data pads and petri dishes, and when she took a closer look she saw that his hands were trembling. What did you find? He asked when he noticed she was looking at his shaking fingers. She raised her head, trying her hardest to keep her eyes trailed on the mask. Ground floor and second floor held nothing interesting, but on the first floor there was a secret library that you should probably check out, and there was a safe in Plague's quarters I couldn't open. He nodded. I'll come up once we finish down here. Anything else? She hesitated but felt like he needed to know. There were quarters, in front of his. Set up for a kid. Khan tensed and shrugged, and she felt something shift slightly in his forced presence, a shadow creeping around his usual Nova-like power. He was hesitating, back then. That was in part why he was on Tatooine. Bonnie recoiled, surprised. He wanted to kidnap him. What stopped him? Sidious, and the rule of two. He was scared that his student would kill the boy if he brought him here, and started teaching him the way of the Sith he said, his tone bland. Beneath his apparent calm though, she could sense his feelings boiling. Unsure of his potential reactions, she picked a reply that would reorient the discussion to less touchy topics. But Sidious had more. He shrugged. He was the apprentice, it was his duty to recruit and train darksiders to try to overthrow his master. Nothing against protocol here. Was it the same back then? Anya asked, worry seizing her heart. The mask didn't give away his expression, but he felt pensive for a moment. I believe so. I think he tried when I was brought back to Coruscant by Jin to be presented to the council. I remember his presence, but at the time I didn't know what it meant. She nodded, unwarranted fear exploding in her stomach at the thought of how close Khan actually was to get kidnapped by a Sith Lord, when he was still just a boy, then released her feeling in the force as best as she could, and shifted closer to him, trying to understand what he was looking at. He pointed at the Petri dishes. midi chlorians cultures. Some he contaminated with various viruses, some he kept clean as witness samples. 
He was trying to get them as resilient as possible. She leaned towards him, curious, but the petri dishes just seemed old and vaguely dirty. Are they still alive? No, they require constant surveillance and the proximity of a force user to survive. The datapads detail everything, he was really quite ingenious, he said, and even with the vocoder, she could hear his disgust. Her earlier fear dimmed, tainted by a nasty impression that made her skin crawl. Whatever he saw in those datapads, it probably was less than palatable. Anything regarding you. There was a faint crystalline noise, and she realized all the items around them were shaking. Not in this room. I found some old records earlier in his archive, coded in a language that only Plagueis understood. This was one of the first steps to my creation, though. The petri dishes broke, the glass shattering under the volatile heaviness his emotions projected in the force. His hands still trembled around the data pad he had grabbed, and through their bond, she could sense how triggered he was by the entire thing. Maybe it hadn't been a very good idea to come here, after all, it was supposed to be interesting, fun, and a good stress reliever. Not a treasure hunt for mental breakdowns material. She put a hand on his arm, trying to replicate the effect a direct contact seemed to have on the bond, and he stilled under her touch, his form as stiff as a board. Did you tour the whole place? I did, it's mostly empty now, apart from the archives. I downloaded everything. This is the last place. Good. She didn't want to spend any more time than necessary here. The uneasy sensation she felt since she went down to join him was only growing stronger. She wanted to leave. They needed to leave. I'll check those data pads, and then we go back up. He groaned in assent and went back to the data pad he had in hands, while she took another one from the pile. The language was very scientific and had a bland way of describing the experiments, but the reality it depicted was gut-churning. Plagueis had first started experimenting on non-sensitive sentients, injecting them with midi-chlorians he cultivated and looking at the results. Most died in atrocious sufferings, but the children survived more often, even if the injection didn't affect their sensitivity to the force. He went younger, and younger still, until it was babies, and got two weak sensitive children out of the hundreds of sacrificed lives. He then killed and dissected them, trying to see where the difference was, how he could do better, and repeated the steps, until he realized it was his own proximity, that kept the midi-chlorians alive during the implantation phase, and that the subject needed a high stem cells count, to be able to develop force sensitivity. Suggesting the midi-chlorians needed to adapt the tissues to achieve a deeper connection of the subject with the force, and that force-sensitive parents had a really high chance of having force-sensitive children. The record stopped shortly after that conclusion, but after sensing how distressed Khan felt she guessed he had read the rest of it, and that it was not any better than what she learned. Ani swallowed, her eyes closing briefly, and realized she didn't really want to know how Plagueis created it. She put the data pads back on the experiment desk and waited for Khan to finish, fidgeting nervously. He was contaminated by a virus Khan finally said. She frowned. A virus. His old master thought he had found the key to immortality and engineered modified midi-chlorians, he called maxi-chlorians that retained his consciousness and would gain control of their host after his death. He tried gaining control of Plagueis and infected him, but something failed. Plagueis lost his foresight ability, but remained in control. Did he experiment further? She asked, her voice coming out at a much higher pitch than usual. He had been in contact with Plagueis, what if a Sith had infected him with whatever disgusting things he was cooking in that thrice damned lab of his? He tried to reverse the effects, but never could. He did develop another technique to avoid dying, however, and managed to resurrect his master's other student quite a few times, with decreasing success. She paled, and swallowed harshly, the implications of what Khan described sending a shiver down her spine. What did he give in exchange? She whispered. Probably nothing, his own power decreased steadily throughout the years, and around 10 years ago he wrote that he was worried the force was beginning to work against him. His experiments all started dying right after my he paused and emitted a burst of static she didn't know how to interpret. A sharp intake of breath, or a sigh. My conception, until I was the only human one left. What about the others? Set free in the force. He stopped the hunts quite a while ago from what I know, so they probably tried to survive in the woods until their death. Her heart clenched painfully when she heard their sad fate, and she sighed. Poor creatures. He flinched, and she realized what she just said. Cursing herself for her insensitivity she was about to correct her statement when he started leaving the room. Let's check out the room you told me about he said harshly, his tone biting. Anya gritted her teeth and followed him on the turbo lift, an apology on the tip of her tongue. Khan looked on phase, but with their proximity, she could literally taste his hurt. She wanted to cry. What was wrong with her? How stupid was she to say something as crude when he was already distressed? He tore through the path to the library and went through the books silently, setting some aside to keep while tossing the others on the floor. The holo books were treated in the same way, most of them discarded. After an hour, he passed by her without saying a word and went straight for the safe, which opened when he touched it. It contained the will of Hago Damas to Plague's true name, a data card with information regarding his assets, shares, and overall fortune, and a book. 
Khan took the manuscript with precaution. It was handwritten and obviously precious. He put it all in his own bag and nodded sharply to her before moving on. He stopped briefly in the room that was supposed to be his, observing the place quietly, and grabbed one of the model spaceships before heading out. He still had not uttered a single word. Anya was starting to panic, horrified at the idea that she had just ruined their friendship with her careless words, but decided against pressing him for now. Their visit over, she helped him place the detonators they had brought with them in key rooms imbued in the dark side, and on major structural points in the fort, then followed him outside, before he pressed the remote that would trigger the explosion. There was a very loud bang that deafened her for a moment, then the whole place went up in flames, crumbling onto itself, and suddenly something started screaming as the spells were destroyed with the stones they were tied to. It was supposed to be the fun part, but she felt nothing positive about the explosion, she just wanted to leave. The smoke had a weird purple tint, and the fire soon turned black, and started to grow to frightening proportions in their direction, the shrilling scream getting closer and closer. It was like it was attracted to them, seeking the destruction of the beings that took down the fort, and she realized that it was the fire that was howling. Baran. For a moment it looked like they would lose and get burned too crisp by the black flames, but halfway through the castle's gardens, it seemed to lose ground, the screaming more desperate and angrier than ever. When they got to the ship they were both out of breath, but it didn't stop them from rushing to the cockpit and starting the ship as quickly as they could, only taking off seconds before the fire took the spaceport. It tried to rose and come after them, but lost energy quickly and vanished in purple smoke clouds above the ruins of Plague's fortress. They laughed. Now that they had left the ground it started to feel good to see the place destroyed. It filled her with a warm buzzing energy that popped in her veins, and dissipated her previous unease. She wanted to celebrate, to drink in honor of the end of sojourn, noon of the hunters, land of debauchery, but something kept her from it. In the force, the foreboding feeling she had grew stronger. Khan. Can you leave Admiral faster? I think something is wrong she said, hands clenched around her seat as something that tasted like fear slowly took over her previous joy. I'm already fast he growled. Faster? Please. His mask was off now, and his brows were furred. She realized distantly that he was still pissed at her, but she couldn't bring herself to care. Something was going to happen, and they needed to be in space when it did. The ship went faster, gaining uncomfortable speed now, and they managed to breach the atmosphere, just as a hissing sound started below them. Khan swore under his breath as he turned the ship on itself to get a view of what happened, and under them a gigantic blast detonated, raising everything on the surface of the moon. The mushroom of smoke produced was white, this time, but nonetheless toxic, and the ship's radiation detectors started to beep frenetically. Khan diverted power to the shields and quickly put distance between the many radiated moon, his breathing hard, lost in thoughts. It was a trap. Looked like a nuclear bomb. Do you think it was planted on the planet? Yes. Sidious knows a Sith kill Plagueis, I think he tried to gain the most out of the place, then managed to get a potent enough bomb. Anya's lips were pinched in displeasure as his statement rang true in the force. Even without knowing them the devious asshole still managed to nearly kill them both. She didn't know if she was terrified or furious. What would be the trigger though? The guards that were here didn't activate it. The safe, I think. It could also have been the destruction of the place, but knowing Sidious he would have gone for the petty thing, and he was probably pissed that it stayed closed for him. We were lucky it was one of our final destinations she said, annoyed at herself. She should have listened to the force a bit more carefully. She had a feeling they needed to leave that started way before they touched that blasted safe, and had disregarded it until the last moments. And lucky that we ran like possessed to the ship, without this and your instinct, we would have been caught by the blast. She smiled at the compliment and decided to return the favor. And lucky that you're such a good pilot. I could have never pulled that off. Let's stop here he replied icily. His rebuff came as a surprise, but she should have seen it coming. Narrowly escaping death together was a great bonding time, but it didn't erase what happened earlier. She had offended him, insulted him in one of the meanest ways she could have, implying he wasn't human, implying he was nothing more than a lab experiment, when he had just discovered the extent of Plague's depravity. His jaw was clenched, and his gaze, avoiding hers, was hard. He entered the coordinate for the first jump, launched them into hyperspace, and after a couple of minutes of awkward silence, he got out of his seat without a word. Feeling terrible about the whole thing, Anya grabbed his sleeve. What? His tone was harsh, and she nearly recoiled under it. Her heart was beating so hard she felt it was going to come out of her chest through her mouth, and her hands were shaky. She held still. I'm sorry for what I said, in the laboratory. He shook her hand off, his expression thunderous. It's fine, you are being honest he replied bitterly, and she knew if she didn't fix this now, she would probably never do. Anya clenched her fists, chest constricted in pain and shame. I was being rude, and insensitive, and wrong. He started walking away, turning his back on her again without acknowledging her words. She could not let this go. This conversation was not over, not if there was even the slightest chance that he did not get what she meant. 
She needed him to understand how bad she had crept up down there, and she knew somehow that he needed it too. Khan. She called after him. It's okay on you, he said, his voice hoarse, his form tense. He didn't turn. She gritted her teeth, pushing through his walls and hers to try and get to him. No, it's not. She was beginning to see underneath the anger now that he felt quieter, and what she saw didn't please her at all. Contempt, disgust, unworthiness, despair. It was fine for him to be called a poor creature because it rang true. Sighing, she stepped closer to him again and put a hand on his shoulder. You're not an experiment, Con Vayner, you're a person, and anyone saying otherwise is wrong. He flinched under her hand like he had been electrocuted, and turned to look at her with confused eyes and a slightly open mouth. She put her other hand in his, clasping them together as she let the last remains of her walls down, the truth in her words singing in the force, violent and loud. Anya let out a quiet guilty sob at the sight of his disbelief and tears start rolling down her face. She was so angry at herself for not seeing his pain, something that must have plagued him since he first went after Plagueis. She thought she knew him so well, she thought she was such a great ally, and she had overlooked his suffering because of her stupid, freeborn, richerous upbringing. Of course, he felt bad, he had thought nearly all his first life that he was a creation from the Force itself, some sort of divine being transcending humankind. Then he had discovered the Sith had a part in his conception, but it was still blurry, incidental. Learning that he had been deliberately engineered by a Sith Lord using the results of decades of terrifying experiments, and then watched like a lab rat by the same Sith Lord for all of his childhood on Tatooine, must have shaken the very foundation of his being. Khan was lost, and she had been excessively cruel with him right when he needed the exact opposite from her. I'm sorry. Her voice was trembling, and she was nearly sure she looked terrible crying in front of him like a child, but he didn't seem to care. Wordlessly, he tugged her towards him and embraced her, his arms wrapping around herself as his own walls came down, letting the bond flare to life at their proximity like it never did before, bright and brilliant and magical. It felt like plunging in a pool of the purest water during a bright, hot summer day, cleansing every negative emotion she felt to only leave fuzzy joy, warm satisfaction, and something below, hidden in small, a bundle of tender, soft feelings she might have called odd. No. It was useless to go there. Not when she was displaying so much of herself to him. There would be time, later, to analyze what she felt, but now she would just enjoy the moment without overthinking it. She closed her eyes, letting the force sing around them without trying to restrain it in any way, and returned his embrace as she leaned against him. The bond sparked at their new proximity, bubbles of fondness and glittery elation, hopping gently around them. There was a deep sense of rightness about the whole experience, something safe and powerful in theirs that left her breathless and vulnerable in a way she didn't hate at all. She could hear his heart beating against her ear, the rhythm steady and powerful, more comforting than any other sound she ever heard. With each beat the force around him pulsated, strong, strikingly beautiful, resonating with her own presence, echoing her feelings. His back felt warm and firm under her hands, his even breathing soothing her previous turmoil. She never wanted to let go, never wanted to give up this place that seemed perfectly fitted for her. The ship had something else in mind, however. A loud beeping noise echoed in the silence, breaking the harmony in tiny little pieces, with all the grace and efficiency of a boulder in a fragile window. She stepped away at the same time as he did, and they both rushed to the cockpit, cheeks flushed, still flustered by the strange moment. We are getting out of hyperspace, I need to plan the second jump he said without looking at her. She cleared her throat. I'll check what's left of Dex's bag and make some tea. I'll join you in a minute. Anya fled to the kitchen and let out a deep breath. She wasn't very hungry, but she needed to get away from the increasingly uncomfortable situation in the cockpit. She prepared the tea in autopilot, mind foggy, her blood buzzing in her veins, leaving her restless. Absent-mindedly she poured two cups and grabbed the bag, checking its content. There were sandwich and some pastries left, it would have to do. The near-death experience followed by the most intense hug of her life, had left her legs weak. She needed to sit, and possibly ingest something sugary. Khan joined her as promised, and her heart started to beat loudly again, as her fingers twitched nervously around her pastry. He sat in front of her, eyes on his cup, and they spent the next few minutes in silence, caught up in their own brains. Anya knew, now, that he was aware of her feelings for him. He had to, their communion had been total for a moment, and the bond still stood between them as proof, humming with their shared emotions. She felt naked, embarrassed, and unsure. How would he react? He had feelings for her too, it rang clear, but that didn't tell her anything about what he wanted to do with them. Maybe he despised them. Maybe he wanted them gone. Maybe a part of him hated to be diverted from their mission in that way. Maybe he never wanted to fall for someone again after what happened in his first life. It didn't help that she didn't know what she wanted herself. She didn't want to endanger their plans with a potentially disastrous love story, and she wasn't even sure she would ever be ready to be with someone in that way again. She didn't deserve him. She was damaged, spoiled goods, weak, and pathetic. What if he learned about it and never looked at her the same? Would he think she was stupid for believing Carner's lies? Would you mock her for being so naive? 
Would you resent ever feeling something for someone so unworthy of it? She finished her tea, her mood darkening with every second of silence. What felt so accessible, at the tips of her fingers minutes ago now seemed distant, impossible, ludicrous even. She hated it and hated herself for even considering that she might be a suitable match for Khan. We need to look through what we took he finally said, breaking the mounting tension between them. The air was heavy, thick with what remained unsaid. I'll get the bag she whispered uneasily, unable to gaze at him. They spent the next two hours engrossed in the data collected that wasn't too heavily encrypted, sorting out what might be more useful to Khan, what might be more useful to her, and what seemed mostly useless. Anya was grateful for the distraction and genuinely excited about their finds. Plagueis had amassed a great quantity of useful information, either regarding his grand plan, the Sith, or even general galactic history, and his seemingly very Cartesian, scientific mind made understanding his way of organizing the data relatively easy after a while. She was midway through a report on the Inchori and their potential usefulness in a surprisingly familiar cloning program, when Khan caught her yawning. The tired he'd run blandly. She couldn't read him, and he had shut himself off from the bond, cutting the feedback she usually received from it. We spent an entire day at the place she replied, hating how unsure and emotional her voice sounded. You should go to sleep. We will have the coming months to comb through everything, there is time. Did he want to get rid of her? Was it his way of telling her he wanted to be alone? You're right. He was, but it wasn't why she wanted to go away from the kitchen. The silence was only getting heavier, her heart slowly tearing inside her chest, as he refused to acknowledge what had happened, and she couldn't take it anymore. She fled to the bathroom, brushed her teeth, took another shower to get the smoke strong scent out of her hair, and went straight to the bed, lying down without daring to glance in Khan's direction. Warm tears were pulling in her eyes, but she refused to shed them. When he gave up and joined her, finally warming up the increasingly cold bed, she was already asleep. Khan woke up after a nightmare-free sleep feeling well-rested for the first time since Corbin, and relatively comfortable, outside of a couple of hairs in his mouth. He tried to remove them with his hand, but quickly find his arm stuck in place by a well-known weight. Anya. Just like the day before, they had gotten closer and closer as the cold grew, and she had ended up half sprawled on him, her head resting comfortably in the crook of his neck. Hence the hairs. Sighing slowly, he used his other hand to pull them out and adjust the cover a little higher, but made no move to step away, silently enjoying the proximity. He would have a lot to discuss during his first appointment with the therapist. Of course, he was already aware that he had feelings for Anya, this was not a surprise, and it was at least in part why he had reacted so violently when she had made that comment in the laboratories. Everything that could hurt, hurt more when it came from her. Her apology surprised him, he didn't, he hadn't thought he needed it, he hadn't thought there was anything false about what she had said, no matter how hurtful it was to hear it. He had been wrong. Her words had touched him, his heart had warmed again, and when he had seen how affected she was he had acted on reflex. It had felt right, natural, but then this whole bond thing had thrown him off. She loved him. It felt bad enough to refrain from acting on his own feelings when he thought she didn't see him as anything other than a friend and an ally. Now it just felt cruel to deny himself what they both seemed to want, and he had been stowing in his own guilt, for refusing to even discuss the topic afterward. Anya needed this, he needed this, but he was a coward, and he was scared. Their status quo was comfortable, their companionship pleasant. What if this ruined everything? What if it pushed him to the dark again, or worse, what if he pushed her to it, corrupting her beyond recovery? He nearly got her killed on his little trip to sojourn. He hadn't sensed the bomb, the danger, he had felt nothing because he wasn't paying attention, and it nearly cost her life. Everyone that got close to him had either been betrayed by him or died in atrocious circumstances, and Padm Padm had paid an expensive price for being with him at the time. No one deserved this fate, and especially not Anya. His love was destructive, and the noble, and probably the best, part of him refused to destroy her. It didn't keep him from relishing in their current situation, and he would have been worthy of Revan's punishment, if he didn't admit it felt at the very least good, if not straight up perfect. Anya's body was warm and soft against his, her breath lightly tickling his neck, her arm draped across his chest, like it was the most natural thing in the world. And in a sense it was. They met well, had a shared past that nobody else knew about, and drama aside, they usually liked to spend time with each other. Adding that to the bond they developed during the ritual that brought them back, and the fact that there was literally no one else they could be truly themselves with, and it wasn't hard to see how their feelings were born. Was it bad that he was so happy it was mutual? Was it such an affront to the galaxy for Khan Vayner to be human, to feel something, and want to explore it? Couldn't he indulge too, once in a while, or was he destined to forever forbid himself from anything he truly wanted to avoid taunting fate again? Was it egoistic to refuse to acknowledge his feelings and actually discuss them with Anya? If he was truly trusting her, shouldn't he share the responsibility of entering or not in a romantic relationship with her? The force hummed in approval, and Khan sharpened his new resolve. He would communicate, and they would decide together. 
He sensed Anya's awareness returning and smiled to himself as he heard her groan against him, his heart melting in his chest. She stayed a moment like that, letting out a small pleased sigh and enjoying his proximity, then realized he was awake as well and straightened her neck. Their gazes met, his amused, her surprise, and she cleared her throat. You're holding me she stated, hesitant and unsure. Do you want me to let go? There was a spark in their connection when their eyes met again, and he saw her cheeks redden, and her throat bobbed. She looked amazing, with her undone hair and glinting eyes, and he wanted to dot no. Kiss her. She beat him to it, though, her lips pressed softly against his in a chaste kiss. He felt his heart explode in his chest, body tensing up and involuntarily pulling her even closer to him. He responded quickly, his other hand pushing himself slightly up to get them a less awkward angle, as he felt her hand coursing through his hair. Force, that felt good. Warmth pulled low in his gut, his mind blank as the kiss deepened, then he heard her moan and nearly lost it right there, only remaining in control by sheer willpower. The force was blazing around them like a wildfire, his skin burning at each point of contact between them. His mental walls leaped under the savage emotions that coursed through him and met Anya's through the bond, increasing their connection in a feedback loop of pure bliss. He caught himself thinking of how good it would feel if they were both naked and intertwined on the bed, how her skin would taste, and what kind of noises she would be making under him, and broke the kiss before he snapped, panting. That was... amazing. They looked at each other and laughed a bit awkwardly, still breathing heavily after their intense makeout session. Anya settled back a bit lower, listening to his heartbeat with a pensive expression, as he released as much desire as he could through the force, reining himself in. After some time compassing himself in silence and oscillating between pure joy and terror, he spoke again. What do we do now? She sighed, sitting up to look at him more easily, and he nearly shivered at the loss of heat. Two covers next time, and at least one made for cold climates, that damned ship was a criffing freezer. Do you want things to change? No. Yes. Maybe. What did he want? I wouldn't mind more of that. Ani smiled, huffing lightly before getting serious again. I would like that too, I just don't want to die. He sighed impact the plan. They were silent for a moment, then she spoke again, eyes glinting with determination. Then if we see we are losing track, we stop everything. Khan nodded, knowing instantly it would never be that simple. It was a reasonable proposal, but a very tough promise to keep. Even now, he could see how damaging their feelings could be for their plans. If she was in danger, he wouldn't care about maintaining his cover. If there was a choice to make, he would choose her over the success of the plan in most situations. She was naive as she thought it didn't already have an impact on both of them. Attachments were never innocent for force sensitives, especially ones that involved him. If he wasn't careful, he would destroy her, and probably sow chaos in the entire world. Again. He wanted to tell her to reconsider. He wanted to tell her it wouldn't work the way she envisioned it. He wanted to remind her he had committed genocide against his own people, once for a fleeting chance of saving the one he loved, and that at the time throwing the entire galaxy into chaos, had seemed a meager price to pay to have the perfect future he wished for them. He was still this man. He was aged, broken, and rebuilt, but the same members that had set everything on fire still burned in his heart, no matter how much he loathed to admit it. The closer they got, the stronger the tempting tendrils of darkness that lurked in his mind would get, ready to ensnare him again at the slightest inconvenience. He wanted to tell her, but he was a coward and he was a selfish man. He kept his mouth shut. Together then? She asked, carefully hopeful as she extended her hand towards him. He laced his fingers with her, knowing he was sealing his fate. Together. Guilt washed over him as he looked into her bright trustful eyes. Was she a greater choice, if she knew what she was getting into? Would she be disgusted if she understood how wicked he truly was, for going after her when he knew in excruciatingly vivid details what pain his love could bring her? Another thing he could talk about to his therapist if he managed to produce a convincing backstory to justify his fear. Shavit. He was starting to look forward to it. Should he tell her? He was already keeping what felt like a mountain of relatively important things from her. It felt a bit hypocritical to keep yet another one a secret from her, when they were now supposedly together, whatever that meant. At the same time, it also felt bad to drop the bomb on her like that, right of the bat, especially when she was bursting at the seams with happiness. Coward. He was a coward. In truth, he kind of owed it to her, after all, she was the one committing to a relationship with his mangled, broken self, and apart from bruising his fragile ego, it wouldn't really do anything to tell her he was trying to fix his mess. He pressed her fingers to get her attention and took a deep breath before speaking. If we are doing this seriously there is something I need to tell you. I dot me too. Anya looked terrorized, which comforted him somehow. If she was so scared of her secret, then she'll take his with a lot more detachment. That was a relief, if a cruel one. After Corb and I realized I was a mess, and I decided to seek help. With the Shans. He shook his head. No, no, I didn't want it to impact anything related to my cover story or the plans. I reached out to a therapist on Talon. I'm starting next week. 
She smiled, supportive and kind, and he hated himself just a tiny bit more. That's wonderful. What I meant to say is that I'm most likely not ready for this. He paused, unsure of where he wanted to go with his statement. I guess I just wanted you to know that this is not because of you. Anya actually kissed him again at that, light and bright and comforting, which made the admission go way easier than he initially intended, and drowned him in enough self-hatred to fill out Moncala's oceans. He felt the bond flare again as her warm lips against his sent pleasing tingles along his spine, and despite the biological reality, his brain was for a minute, convinced that he could stay like that all day without doing anything else. When she broke off the kiss, Anya looked a bit flushed, but also a bit tensed. He thought back to Corbin and his eyes whitened. Was she going to tell him about the trauma that made her so wary there? She looked down, apparently not wanting to cross his gaze, and whispered. When I was held at the Imperial Center, before they moved me to Bis, something happened. I can't dot I can't speak of it. It will not be simple, for me, but I want to try. This time he was the one who kissed her, his brain providing him with all he needed to know to fill in the blank. Anya had been assaulted, probably multiple times, by someone at the palace. There was a great chance that it was under Palpatine's orders, nothing happened outside of his orders in that wretched place, and there was at least some sort of emotional manipulation involved knowing the Emperor. Fury coursed through his veins, the dark side a whisper away from him, coating his very lungs with its poisonous power, ready to strike, to lash out, to destroy in retaliation for what they did. The distressed shape in his arms was the only thing stopping him from a terrible tantrum, the type he used to had when Sidious just did something particularly heinous about him to remind him of his place in the Serp control. The type that usually led to a senseless murder spree to relieve his anger issue. Maybe this point in particular he would avoid bringing up with the therapist at first. No need to scare him away before he could figure out a convenient lie to justify his past experiences. He was considering using people's general misunderstanding of the Force to pretend having experienced either visions of the future or of an anterior life, depending on how credible it felt at the time, and the number of details he was ready to share. Anya's arms wrapped around his back as she leaned towards him, and he suddenly felt quite bad for thinking about absolutely anything else than her during this moment. He returned her embrace, breaking the kiss and tucking her under his chin. Having her in his arms felt like home in a way nothing ever truly did, the sensation soothing the last bits of shadows clawing at him. The darkness retreated, his fury quelled by the calm feeling, and he held her closer. They spent the rest of their journey in relative proximity, studying the data collected and drinking copious amount of tea in between tentative make-out sessions that definitely helped pass the time. Anya changed to a more holiday-appropriate dress shortly before they entered Coruscant's atmosphere, something pleasantly flowy in a deep red shade that she would never be caught dead wearing outside of a very relaxed situation. It was in the early evening, the sunset casting reds, golds and purples on the skyline, and it reminded him of the one they watched on Corbin. As he did the first time he landed the ship on the Serenian Senepad, but this time he was in no hurry to take off again. They shared a long farewell kiss on the ramp, hearts beating as one, then Anya started to step away, grabbing her suitcase. May we meet again she said with a gentle smile. May we meet again. She disappeared from his sight and he went back to the cockpit, throat tight and heart heavy. He was going to miss her, he realized. Khan flew out slowly, waiting what seemed like an eternity to get clearance to exit Adam, and taking his time programming Talarvin's coordinates in a computer, before he grabbed his data pad again, to ask for a meeting with the local intergalactic bank. With the will of Hago Damask in his hands, he had some administrative work to do before he could lose himself in the mountain of knowledge they had stolen from Plagueis. Rewarding administrative work though, and a fair comeback for Sidious's petty nuclear bomb attack. He was mad about another Sith existing in the same galaxy as he did. Too bad for him, because Khan was there to stay, while Sidious would wither away like the decrepit old fool he was.